Kira Marie Moore, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. So good to be here. Like, so we were talking about before about this evolution, and I think everyone goes through these changes and evolutions as a result of different reps that we all do. So you're going through one. Does it still feel like shedding of uh, snake skin like it always does, or is it better after uh, you know three or four rounds of shedding the skin? You mean, is it uncomfortable and not much fun and some really tricky moments of navigation? Absolutely, a hundred million percent, right? But I think that's the kind of landscape we're dealing with right now across the globe, right? Is that life is changing so fast. We have to be more flexible and we have to think in different ways and doing life and business and building out how we used to do it. It's just not going to cut anymore. So I think we're all on this journey, how quick you can sort of get back up and navigate what they can look like. I think that is key. And that's, you know, I'm at that point right now. We are, we are heading into some new things and I'm excited about it. And also, it's a lot of hard work. Let's talk about what you're excited about. What are you building from? And what are the changes that are happening? Yeah, I think, you know, what is interesting is we talk about niches a lot in the entrepreneur world. And what niche do you have? And what is the problem that you're solving and the solution that you bring? And I think the difficulty is that when you are different, that you've got different insights and different learnings and you want to bring and pioneer maybe some innovative thinking and even maybe just a little disruptive thinking, then you've got to interpret it from what you have been doing. So what I've done with private clients behind the scene, worked with a lot of the little thing people would say is you're like the secret source behind a lot of great leaders and that is kind of great until you want to market that out to the world. And then how does that bring a solution in a world that doesn't fit necessarily how you think? So I think for me, what has been key is interpreting what I do on the global space and then bringing that back to the everyday human and going, how can I help you make smarter decisions, more effective decisions, lead in your industry and then get the actual results you want and take it to a next level. So how has that evolution changed and where does the podcast yeah. and your content fit into this whole equation? Yeah, so I've got two podcasts and two of those podcasts have been phenomenal in, in part of being part of my journey, right? But I think we've done the season of what it was. And now it's like looking at how can it be going forward? So there's two two podcasts, The Decision Table, and then Global Human Intelligence Podcast. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like if we look through the lens of disruptive leadership, making smarter decisions at the table, and then taking people into maybe a little bit of curiosity of what a new approach could look like. And like my whole thing is really around human intelligence. You know, you talk about AI, I talk about HI human intelligence. And I believe the combination between human intelligence and AI is key to this ever-changing landscape. In other words, what if we were smarter humans able to make smarter decisions with the help and support of what we know is the future with technology? How can we now make that and bring that to the table and make the solution that is needed for all of us to get to our next level. I love that we're here because inevitably we would get <laughs> to this point. I believe it's the alignment of human intelligence, artificial intelligence and divine intelligence. And I love that you brought this up because yeah. I think you can jam on this that I think it's really important because there's no other way to ethically as a human dictate how the artificial intelligence is supposed to function without bringing divine intelligence into the equation because you know that is the easiest way to align i suppose from an ethical standpoint i'd love to hear your thoughts on how the human can get smarter at the decision table using these new technologies and your viewpoint on how this is all evolving yeah so firstly i think human intelligence let's bring it back to the basics and i think some of these big concepts 
that's where I get to interpret it and my big like sort of playing field and going, how do we even just think about human intelligence, right? Well, that's the decisions we're making, how we are wired. It's made up with the patterns that our brains are going through, our conditionings, our biases, all of those things. And then going, what then from that pattern that our brain is wired to are the pathways in which we now make decisions at the table? And by the way, every decision helps us get that solution or outcome that we're heading for. So if we look at it and we break down what patterns that we have put in place, well, I talk about ecosystems. I believe in as we go forward, we have to build out not businesses, organizations, but ecosystems. Because here's the thing that I've learned, I'm not sure about you, but I know this is true for me and my world, is that it is so easy to think, yes, this is what we're building out in the professional world. This is what we're doing in our personal world. Spiritually, this is what I believe. Physically, this is who I am. But here's the thing that I know. Every decision in all of those areas are going to help you build out your ecosystem. And it's got to have effortless flow from all of those things for you to be able to access the capacity that you actually can do to play at a much bigger level. And that is where, like any muscle, that I believe we have muscle that create our human intelligence and we have to learn, we have to know what they are. And then we have to learn how to actually work those muscles and put, and then know how to put them in play. If I bring it back to AI for a second, right? Because I know that's your world. If all you knew was, hey, there's a great piece of technology. Fantastic. And you know how to use that, Ronsley, but I don't. Here's the thing that I know. If I was able to make us smarter questions, know what questions to ask, know how to ask those in a more effective way, I'm going to get a better result out of that piece of technology. Most people, what I was going to say was, have forgotten how to think for themselves, hope that the piece of technology will help them, and then wonder why they're not getting the results that they thought they were going to. And I think it's the same with people. I mean, you're talking about technology, replace the word technology mm -hmm. with people. And that becomes the same issue with leadership, right? We Absolutely. don't know how different people function. And as a result, don't know how to lead them. As a result, use the cookie yes. cutter approach. And as a result, lose people and then don't know how to scale. And I find that this is a really great conversation. And to your point, I mean, thank you for just saying, let's riff because this is not how I plan this to go. And But this is way better than how... <laughs> I plan this to go. There's all these pathways and you talk about this a lot, right? You talk about ecosystems, you talk about pathways, you talk about patterns and ecosystem. If I interpret an ecosystem, it's a fully functioning system that can survive on its own, right? Which yeah. means nothing is wasted and it means everything is being used and it's being used for good. And it's the same I suppose, with our businesses and with artificial intelligence and human intelligence and what we're talking about, like, I feel like we've got to capture some of this ancient wisdom because right now AI is learning from history that's documented by people who have been in power, but not necessarily from the ancient wisdom that has been probably around for ages that might have been destroyed in this whole colonization piece. So if AI is not learning there, then like what are these conversations that need to be brought or need to be had that can help us learn these new pathways and learn from old patterns? I think what we tend to do is we default back to what we know because that's easy. We can move in that. We can have certainty in that, confidence. Hey, I know how that works. What we do know, if we look at patterns across the globe, economically, socially, environmentally right now, and in everyday business decisions, right? In our families, you name it. If we look at what we keep defaulting to, it is not hard to find that there is so much displacement, so much discrimination, so much that is not working for us, economy falling apart. Like there are so many pieces like that, right? So Somewhere along the line, those patterns that we're defaulting back to and the decisions we're making, whether in our business, physically, emotionally, spiritually, you name it, 
we are making things and defaulting back to an old story, an old approach. Mm. What I know now is that we have to put a line in the sand and go, what are we not going to default back? Because we know it doesn't serve us. It doesn't work for us and it's not working for others around us in our world or getting us the results that we want. So if that's the truth, then what is it? What are the new patterns? What's a new approach that we have to think about? And for that to happen, we have to be willing that maybe we don't know what we don't know. Maybe it's time for us to have a curiosity and create tables where we're not necessarily going to understand everything and that's okay. Or we're not necessarily going to agree with everything and that's okay too. Or maybe sometimes we just need to be quiet and listen to others' perspectives. And then even if all we did was learn one thing from each other, maybe the world could be a little different and maybe we could have a new approach to how we lead in our sphere of influence and then make decisions at at our tables. I mean, it's fascinating you're saying all this and because what I remember because you happened to be there was the t-shirt that I wore at Hawaii airport. Yes. And everyone keeps thinking that it's about me using the word, but it's actually about me having opening up the conversation that you're jumping to a conclusion without actually understanding what the conversation is about, which is, has been happening for ages, right? It's like, I don't understand this or I'm picking up one thing and running with it. I'm keen to hear your thoughts on that situation because you've obviously seen it. What are your thoughts on that situation? We are part of systems. We're part of conditionings. We're part of biases. And just as you and I function in the way that we do, it doesn't always function or work in the old system and the old way of doing things. And we are so scared right now of things like cancellation. You know, you might say the wrong thing, insult someone, do whatever. We are, there's systems that are really broken, but they were put in place for the safety of the general population. And for me in that situation, what you were wearing was so loud and so standing in one direction, the gap between where you were and where most of those people on that plane were would have been huge. I'm here not to say that I'm right in wearing the t-shirt, not one bit. I'm here to open up the conversation to the idea that just because something you see offends you doesn't mean you are not meant to see it. And I agree. Can I ask a question? Say they did it because there were really religious reasons to why they would say something like that. Sometimes our voices can make too much noise that it clashes with other voices. How do we do that in an elegant way? That was fine for you to be able to do that. And you had no problems with that. And by the way, I had no problems you wearing that Peter, either. If I was in Saudi Arabia, for example, I would not wear that shirt because religiously that shirt would offend yeah. them. However, I was in the United States that says I have freedom of speech. Yes, you were in the, the US, but you were jumping on an Australian flight and Australia is not quite the same. Fair enough. Different cultures have different ways of expressing themselves. And mm -hmm. just because the gap is so big doesn't mean a culture has to like or a group of people need to dim themselves and only the things that are culturally appropriate are the ones that are meant to be heard and you're right like how do we do this in a way that that this is okay because that's norm to you and that's the way you voice things you've got to invite people who have a different perspective you've got to be willing by the way to have uncomfortable conversations that just culturally wasn't things that we would talk about around the table i've got to be willing to navigate the uncomfortable and i think there's a couple of things that we have to get better at this, Ronsley, for this to actually occur. And that is that we have to learn how to disagree at the table. If you think differently, if you disagree, then lots of people will either shut you down or exit you from being able to have a seat at that table. And then when we're able to have that uncomfortable conversation and disagree, we need to be okay to disagree and go, but what's the one thing that we could actually agree on to keep shifting and moving it forward, right? 
So I could disagree with everything that is being said, but there is one thing that every one of us agree that we would want to see a change in and then being willing to actually action that and put something in play. And that's yeah. where I go from micro shift, that one thing, to actually seeing a macro change. How mm -hmm. can we get better to open up those conversations and be okay with someone disagreeing with our viewpoint? I talk a lot about disruptive leadership right now. And I feel that as leaders, that we have to be willing to stand for our non-negotiables, whatever that is, right? And people are looking for people to stand strong in a world that it's not cool to stand strong. Mm -hmm. It is not good sometimes to be looking different and to be out there. And I can tell you it is working very much in my world where there are so much more people who are respecting me because I'm willing to stand up for some of the things that and to speak with such honesty and rawness and realness in a place where I, I could have the opportunity to not look like that and to be quiet or to just say what everyone else wants me to say out there to make everyone feel comfortable. So I think there's that side of it, you as a personal. Then it's us as a collective. We have to be willing to then open our table up and invite people to that and start leading that conversation. But here's the caveat to it, and I think it's the tricky piece and why more don't do it. I think there's a real willingness right now to go, yeah, we need different people at the table where we can facilitate that conversation because otherwise you get people with getting their backs up, you get people misunderstood, you're not hearing me, you're not even listening, you get people dominating the conversation. And like people just screaming louder than the other person and it becomes this Correct. screaming. You spend a lot of time with elders and these indigenous cultures and learning how leaders make important decisions. What are the key learnings for us to take into our lives to be able to do it ourselves. We have to be ready to get curious that maybe there's something I don't know. Maybe it's a different lens in which they ask questions or think through. And we have to listen more in that way. But we also have to be able to be willing to ask questions because the power has been that I've been able to ask really great questions to be able to get the insights and learnings that I had from across the globe. And that is in the moment, you have to know when to be quiet. You have to know when to step up. I remember I was at the table with one of the most amazing moments with former presidents of countries and nations, and it was closed doors. And I was in there and we were talking about future, like forward leadership and how we didn't like where leadership was going what it looked like. And so you think about the old approaches here, are the 10 principles to being a great leader right, kind of concept. And so they agreed we didn't like where it was going. And, and that was great. Yes, we all said that. Okay, great. So then they were about to go, well, here are the 20 new, basically, rules, principles, ways to think as a leader. And I just challenged them in that moment and said, what is stopping from in five years' time I reckon probably a year's time, you know, 20 years time, 50, whatever, 100 years time, someone looks at this and goes, oh my goodness, why did they put those in? Because we only make those rules, principles, whatever, boundaries, you name it, through the lens of what we know. And this is what I challenged them. I said, what if we did like the 20 lenses in which to ask more effective questions as leaders across the globe? So what I mean by that is instead of me Presuming I know what you want, Romsley, where you believe we should go and the decisions you want to make, I ask a question that then starts that awareness that we need to bring to the table. They just looked at me like deer in, in spotlights, you know. It was just too far for them to even comprehend. But it is moments like that that I believe we have to start thinking how can we innovate different ways at the table in which we will bring a different solution because I know for me with children hey, I want to make sure I'm leaving behind it for the generations and the generations to come a platform where one they have a voice but they're able to use that voice for good yeah as now as you know a, a population 
what are the things that you disagree with? What are the things that you're seeing that you're kind of like, can we disagree out loud? Are you brushing up against the line with your disagreement? Or is it just disagreement where there's a bunch of people already in that same pool disagreeing with you? Yeah, I think it's interesting. And I think that's what I, I've noticed is that there is actually a willingness for people to to be okay that if you've got different beliefs or different thoughts or insights around things. I think the hardest thing is less about disagreeing right at this moment. If I show up unapologetically in all that I do, what does that actually look like? And I think the pushback that I got when I asked myself that question was this. I don't want to show up unapologetically and then you think that I think I'm so smart and you're dumb and you shouldn't, like, that is so not what I want, right? Yet I can tell you in the past, if I bring my smartness, you should see how some people respond or react to that, right? If I stand strong in what I believe, even if my, say, spiritual belief is different, It's okay to be different in other ways, but if I have a spiritual belief that it's different, that's often makes the other person feel uncomfortable. And so that's not a right at the table. And that is not always easy either. And I think the last piece of that is if I stand up unapologetically and I do crazy things like I'm doing at the moment, which is one of my personal goals physically, because I know there's a correlation between how we show up physically to the output in which we play in the business world. I've seen it many, many times. Uh, A great example of that is the 75 hard concept, right? Those that actually we had, you know, with our company that there was a whole bunch of people that said, yes, yes, we're in, we're going to do the 75 hard. Lots and lots and lots. Seriously, so many. And Every day, more and more, we're dropping off until the end. And here's the thing. So there's three different phases. It's over a year. And there were only three people that made it. Two guys and me out of everyone that did it. It was crazy. You're, you're telling me that, you're, please, please tell me that I'm one of the two guys because I joined. The yeah. Thing. Out of all of those people, it was crazy. But here's the thing that I also know is there's a correlation to how people play. People are willing to do whatever it takes. People are willing to play at a big level. People will make it a non-negotiable, the ones that make it. Watch that in business. Have a look at the correlation. It is crazy, right? Like seriously crazy. Anyway, if we do that in our decisions at the table and we turn up unapologetically, It's like in my personal goal that I was saying, the physical, is that I want to change my story from the moment that I was in a wheelchair to actually getting on stage. And so I'm going down a bodybuilding kind of process right now. There's many that would judge me for that. There's many that will go having to prove herself or do whatever. And I don't care. What I care, I don't even want to, honestly, I don't even want to do the stage piece. But there are some things that make that stage piece a non-negotiable for me right now. And I'm doing it because if I am to show up, then this is one of those moments that I'm doing it. Is it uncomfortable? Absolutely. Do I have time to do it? You know my schedule knows the answer. But I will do whatever it takes for me to be able to do this. Why? I'll tell you why that's important for me. One, because I want to change the story. I don't want to default back to the old story of the wheelchair. I want you to now be able to take this from stage and propel forward on that. I will say, you know, I started the 1% movement and I know as a 1%er, it's going to take you a capacity way beyond what the everyday person is willing to do. This is me role modeling what it takes to be a 1%er right? And I want my body functioning, optimizing what it can bring to the table. And because I've had these conditions in my body, I've had glitches in my body. Here's the thing I know about when you go on stage, you cannot have glitches because you're going to be uneven. Muscles are going to grow in funny ways. So I have to master my body to be able to do that. Great. That ticks that. 
And it's highly motivating to do the hard work to actually get that happening. And then the last piece of that is this, that then I have, if I'm to show up unapologetically, right? I have to show up in this world where you can judge me and others can judge me. And in the past, I would have thought, oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm not going to do what I'm meant to do because I don't want to step on other people's toes. Oh, I don't want to do that because, you know, I'm not good enough to do that. Whatever it is, right? I want to be able to stand on stage and go, I did the work the best I could have to get me to this point right now. And that is why I'm standing on the stage. And that is how I think, how do you go against all the different things? Those are the hardest moments is getting past what you are willing to stand up for, what you are willing to say is your non-negotiable and what you are willing to do to take the micro shifts to get the macro change. Beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, join the 1%movement.com is where you go to find all the cool stuff that Kieran Marie is up to. And in general, I think you should just Google some of her podcasts and listen in to the conversations that she's uh, having and opening up. So thank you for this conversation. Thank you for indulging me in having one with me about having difficult conversations. I think it's one of the pleasures of my life to disagree in general and find the line and deliberately cross it, maybe. <laughs> we need people like you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>